Not so been at Natch. 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 Not so hot got a bit. Not so hot got a bit. Not so hot got a bit. Not so hot got goo a bit. Hey ha, ni ha hu hut. Hello and thank you so much for joining us on another episode of Tsitsistas and Hanana A Today, Cheyenne and Arapaho Today. I'm Darren Brown, coming to you from the beautiful studios of Cheyenne and Arapaho TV here in Concho, America. Today's show is divided into two parts. Uh, with both a historical and contemporary theme to them. Um, the first one we want to talk about is, you know, back in those, what we call the old days, a lot of uh, native languages weren't written down. It wasn't like English where you write your ABCs. Uh, so much of everything was passed down orally through stories. Uh, you know, like your grandpa tells you stories, and when you get older, hopefully you tell your grandkids those stories and you pass them down that way. We have uh, a person who works at the tribe who just recently wrote this book called The Magpie and the Turtle. And it's a cool little story. Look at all this great artwork in here. But I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to let you hear from him uh, himself. His name is Timothy Yego. So uh, let's go check out what Timothy has to say about the turtle and the magpie. Hello, greetings everybody. How you doing out there? My name is Tim Yego Jr. and I'm here with you today as an author. Uh, they asked me to come and I want to take the opportunity to read to you my first children's book. It's, a, uh, it's The Magpie and the Turtle. And uh, what I did with this book, it's a, it says here it's a Native American inspired folktale. So kind of what I did was I took some of our old stories, you know, I'm Kiowa and I took some of our old, you know, our myths about same day and you know, I kind of took those stories and was inspired by our old stories, you know, our old native stories. And I used that to kind of really incorporate into my story. So I, so I really, what I say it's like a, it's a new story told in an old way. So, yeah, this is The Magpie and the Turtle, written by Tim Yeg Timothy Yego Jr., illustrated by Sarah Gledhill. Every day, on his way toward the river for his daily swim, Turtle passes by Magpie's tree. And every day, from way up on his branch, Magpie mockingly hollers down to Turtle. He says, hey Turtle, why are you so slow? And what is that big hump on your back? You can barely lift your head to look at me. Magpie sticks out his chest and raises his wings. See how big and strong my wings are? These wings allow me to fly very fast. By the time you make it to the river, I can travel back and forth many times. I feel sorry for you. Then Turtle slowly looks up to Magpie. Oh, Magpie, how long do you think that nose of yours will actually get? Maybe you can stick it out and other birds can rest on it like you rest on that branch. Turtle lifts his head high and sticks out his shell as best he can. See how strong and tough my shell is? It keeps me safe, Magpie, and you have nothing to protect you. You're just a small, frail little bird, and I feel sorry for you. While Magpie and Turtle were having a go at each other, out slithering in the grass comes Snake. And what we need to know about Snake is that he only cared about one thing, himself and he was very hungry. So suddenly, he got a clever idea. The next day, as Turtle slowly plods along, Snake, being the trickster that he is, transforms himself into a little cottontail. He bounces his way up to Turtle. Hey Turtle, I have seen how Magpie must treat you. I, will, I have something for you over here behind this boulder that will help you get back at that dumb bird. Turtle looks at the funny cottontail and thinks about it for a second, but decides he really does not want to see Magpie hurt. 
So he says, no thanks, and goes upon his turtle way. Hungry, snake slithers behind his rock, thinking of how to fill his belly. And so the next day, <clears throat> he spies a uh, magpie um, on his branch. Snake, being tricky again, turns himself into a small barn swallow, a small barn swallow, and flies up to see magpie. Magpie, my friend, I have seen how Turtle says insulting things to you. If you come with me behind this boulder, I have something that will let you get back at that turtle for good. Magpie looks curiously at the strange looking swallow and thinks for a bit. Thank you, but though Turtle does make my feathers itch, he is still a part of this earth and needs to be here. At that, vexed and defeated, Snake slithers away. We know that Snake wasn't really a barn swallow, and we know that Snake wasn't really a cottontail. We know he had no real plans to help Magpie or Turtle. He only cares about himself and filling his belly. And so, the next time Turtle passes Magpie's tree, although different, they realize they are both important and that they are valuable in their own separate ways. So Magpie looks at Turtle, and Turtle looks back at him. Sure is a good day to be a turtle, says Turtle, and it's a good day to be a magpie, says Magpie. The end. Yeah, this is, a, this is my first children's book, and um, as you can tell, there were elements in there that were kind of inspired by old uh, native tales. Um, there's, excuse me. <clears throat> you'll find that in um, many old traditional stories, you'll see like a trickster, and that's what I, that's what I noticed as I was kind of, you know, from a little boy hearing those stories, and as I researched a little bit, you always see the element of a trickster or things like that, and so I wanted to bring that to my story. And the trickster, you know, the trickster was a snake in my in this story. When you see how he was tricky and he tried to, you know, trick the turtle and trick the magpie uh, to no avail. <clears throat> but tricksters in, in old stories weren't always, you know, negative characters or bad guys, you know, as it were in this story. <clears throat> Sometimes tricksters, uh, the trickster of the trickster or the uh, mythological figure would come and he would do things to help the tribe. I think of one story uh, from my, from the Kiowa tribe, the uh, same day uh, at as it was told that the, our, our creation story, he came along and he, uh, the Kiowa, it says that they were under, they lived under the ground, they were subterranean. And, um, you know, saying they said, I want you to go on the earth. And so they said, okay, how do we do it? And they said there was a hollow cottonwood tree in the ground. And same day, uh, as a trickster, turned all the Kiowas into ants, they said, and they began to climb out of that cottonwood tree. And so you saw how the trickster in that story, or same day, the mythological uh, figure, was used to help and bring bring hope to the Kawa people and help them in a good way. <clears throat> so you see that, and that's kind of really what inspired me. And and people, I have some kids that ask, you know, well, what happened? You know, there was no real ending, or there was no, mm, you know, thing that what happened. To the, what happened to the snake? You know, it just kind of just like it kept going on. And that kind of that's kind of how it is in some of our ending stories. There's never, sometimes there's not an end. Things continue going forward. They continue moving on. And that's kind of what my whole idea was to bring that in here, was to, to show that even though, like, what what like what was going to happen to the snake? He was upset and he went on. And, he, and it says he slithered away to do what? Probably trick again. To probably, you know, continue his path of being tricky. So it kind of leaves that up to your imagination. And then the magpie and turtle, they kind of have some kind of sense of, valuing each other but you know who knows as they move continue on in life they might hit bumpy roads again so yeah those were kind of the things i took from native american uh folk tales and myths and i wanted to bring them bring that inspiration into my story today <clears throat> so yeah <clears throat> another thing i kind of wanted to talk about was the pro like i said i'm i'm a, you know this is my first book i'm an author and i want to talk about like being an author, I'm not necessarily a writer. I'm not. I'm not a great writer at all. You know, I mean, I, have, I I have hard time with punctuation and things like that. 
<clears throat> and so I always thought that writing a book or having a book was going to be very difficult because I've always, I've always wanted to have a children's book, you know, since I was real little. I always wanted, I always drew and made my own stories, <clears throat> and so I always um, was always had a thought that I would have a children's book, and so. But the process just seemed so difficult for me. I had no experience in writing. <clears throat> I had no experience publishing anything or things like that. Until one day I had a friend kind of who wrote a book. I said, hey, man, how did you do that? And he hooked me up with a publisher. And he says, you got a story? I said, yeah, I got this story. You know, I wrote for my kids' uh, school one day, for Land Run Day. I, I just needed a story, so I kind of developed this story. And um, I said, yeah, I got a story. So I typed it up, right? I put it on a manuscript, as a manuscript as they call it. I sent it to the publisher, and we worked on a deal. <clears throat> and over time, he began to edit it and began to piece it up and things like that. And um, he um, introduced me to the author, Sarah, I'm the illustrator. And just as it, I, it just came together, you know. So something that I thought was so difficult that I could never even fathom to accomplish, once I started going, moving toward it, it really became easier in many ways. It really became something that, wow, this is this is more attainable than I thought. You know, that's kind of, that's the thought I had. Like, I always was scared of trying new things or trying something different. But once you put yourself out there and, and you get into a position where, hey, let me just try this. For me, you'll find that you know, it's not as scary or as daunting as I thought it was. You know, the process, it just kind of clicked, click, kind of went along. And, and I guess back in, and so back in April, May of 2019, I, that's when I first initiated contact with the publisher, Atmosphere Press, and he edited it. And then from there on, we illustrated it and put it in these, you know, put the, put the, pieced it together, you know, got all those things. I got the cover art and all that stuff. And so from May to about October, it came out October 1st, 2019. So it was a six-month process from initiating. So what my so my encouragement is to you is to, like, whatever you want to do, if, if things seem overwhelming or seem, oh, I can't really do that, just step toward it, you know? Take that initial step, and maybe you'll see piece by piece, you know, as you kind of go along. It's not as scary and as fearful and as difficult as your mind's telling you it is. And that's kind of what, that's how I felt about writing this. So yeah, do I want to write more books? Certainly. I certainly have a few in mind, you know, and, and things like that. And I want to see, hopefully I get to see some of you young people as you kind of go. I know there's many good artists and maybe one day we'll hook up and say, hey, I need someone, to, I need a native person to help draw and, and illustrate a story of mine. So you never know. You never know what good can come from um, from you just kind of going and moving forward in a good way. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, that was kind of the process. And uh, I just want to say thank you, and I appreciate you allowing me to come and share my story with you. I want to say aho. Thank you. Not Nish Not hey Niv No ho Not salt Nish salt Not note Salt Dote Doho not Doho Nish Doho Nahe Doho Niv Doho Noho Doho Na Salt Doho Nish Salt Doho Na Note Doho Salt Nish Salt How about that? A great story with a great lesson to be learned. Just respect those around you.
the world will be a much better place. So we had all those animals that were important to Native American culture. We're going to stay there for this next segment and talk about an animal that was not just important in Native American culture, but a lot of the Plains tribes could not have lived without it. I'm talking about the American bison, more commonly known as the buffalo. So my good friend Francine Williams is going to tell you all about what's called the buffalo box and how the buffalo kept our ancestors alive. Hello, my name is Francine Williams and I work with the Cheyenne Arapaho Tribe's Johnson O'Malley program. I'm here to present the buffalo box um, that we have that we uh, take to the schools and present to them the buffalo box and all the parts of the buffalo. The buffalo, uh, today we still uh, have buffalo in our tribe. We have a little over 500 head of buffalo that we are uh, raising and the buffaloes that we have uh, the tribe allows some of our programs to have a, a buffalo um, the meat is delivered to our tribe's uh, diabetes wellness program and also to our head start program and so we still, we still use the buffalo, and back in uh, a long time ago, in the time um, our ancestors uh, relied on the buffalo. And so we relied on it as a, a food source, but also we used the different parts of the buffalo. And I'll just go over a little bit of that information of the buffalo, the skin of the buffalo, um, how we use the buffalo skin, and how we made different items such as clothing, such as moccasins, and the different types of the, the skin and how we used it was when they took the skin of the buffalo, you know, they, they tanned it, they smoked it, and it became a buffalo robe that they would wear to keep them warm in the winter time but also to lay down on uh, as part of their their bedding but also they sometimes they would remove the skin and then they would take the skin and they would remove all the hair off of there and then they would tan it and it would became part of their clothing they would make leggings, shirt, shirts from it, and they would make their moccasins from it. And then the skin was also used, they would dry the skin and it became a piece of leather. And this part of the skin would be, become part of their shoe, their sole of the shoe. Like we have shoes now, we have rubber soles. And back then, they would make their moccasins and they would use the leather for the bottom of the sole of their moccasins. So the leather was also used for other items that they made. The parfleches, the boxes that they would keep their belongings in. So this was made out of rawhide as well. So we have the different types of skin that they used and then today the buffalo robe um, the northern Arapaho still use the buffalo robe during their ceremony time you know they'll bring out a buffalo robe and it I'm not sure how old that buffalo robe is but it's sacred to our people up in the north and um, what they would do is they'll bring that buffalo robe out to the people and they say that if you have a new baby you could put that baby on that buffalo robe and let that baby roll on it or they would cover it and that means they were going to bless that baby that baby's life or if somebody is sick and they uh, they would put that person on that buffalo robe and they would wrap that person and cover it cover them and it's supposed to 
they, they believe that buffalo robe is a healing uh, robe and also is a blessing because some of the people will come out and they'll bless themselves with that buffalo robe. There's other parts of the buffalo that they used. Um, this is the buffalo tail and they would use it as a fly swatter or a small brush to brush the floor of their, of their teepee floor or they would use it as a fly swatter. And then they had the dew claws that they would use. They would clean the dew claws out and they would use them as containers. They would store their beads in there, their cedar, just different items that they would store. Same way with the smaller dew claws. They would clean it out and use them for little containers. Some of the bones that they used, this is the, a rib bone. They would use these bones. This is a flesher. It's used as a scraper. This is an awl. As they would make an awl out of the bones, sharpen the edge, make it pointy. That way they could put a hole in the material when they were making their clothing or they could put a hole in the rawhide as well. This is very sharp and they would use that to uh, make clothing. This flesher they would use to scrape the meat off the hide, also the hair off the hide. And they would use the bones to make other tools to bend things because these bones are really strong bones. They're able to use these bones to help bend and make their uh, bow and arrow. You know, they have their bows. They were able to use this, this bone to make arrows or uh, to make their bow and arrow. Also, they would use the teeth, the buffalo teeth, as a decoration, as well as the beard of the buffalo. They would use that as well as a decoration on their teepee. This is the goatee of the buffalo. It, go, it was, you know, located under their chin. <clears throat> also, the bones, these smaller bones that were used as children's toys, and they would pretend that they were horses. So these were their horses, or they would pretend that they were some type of animal. But this is something that they would give to the children to use as their toys. Also, the inside of the buffalo, there was a part that they used, and it was called the bladder of the buffalo, which they did, they, you know, they emptied the bladder they would boil it, and then they would use it. it. It became plastic. It's plastic. It feels like a plastic container. And they would fill their water. They would get their water and carry it. This is their. Uh, this was their uh, container to carry their water. And they also made um, pouches that they would hold. Their porcu porcupine quails or their beads. They would hold their items in these pouches that they were able to make out of from their from the bladder. Also, they have the horn that that we use as a, a drinking cup. Today, we still use the horn in several ceremonies that we have, our sweat lodge ceremony. We still use the buffalo horn. We get the water, dip the water, and pour the water on the hot rocks, and it makes it steamy inside the sweat lodge. So there's still things that we still use here uh, today in our, our ways, in our Indian ways, our ceremonial ways. Um, like the meat of the buffalo, uh, it's very good and, and lean meat. 
Um, we make, we have roast, we have hamburgers, um, just different types of uh, dishes that we use, the buffalo stew, stew meat. Uh, if you ever have a chance to uh, eat buffalo, you should try it. It tastes very good and it's very tasty. It's very healthy for you. And um, I like buffalo. And well, I would like to thank you for uh, watching my presentation on the buffalo box. I hope you learned something today about the buffalo and the parts of the buffalo and how powerful the buffalo is to us still today and that how important it is, the animal is to us as native people and how much we respect the buffalo. And in closing, I just want to thank you again for giving me this opportunity to present this, uh, this presentation to you today. Thank you. Ha ho. Ni cha ane sitte na. Ni wa te na bithwa na te awu. Bini je i ni ni thinawa bithwa na te awu. Ni bat ni bay in na. Bini je i. Ni batcha ani bay na na ni ba bata na 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 hey back ni sate hey back what thing be thwa hot the awu don hey daya tho u hat be the hen hika ha bata na na Ji had ni bait and all. Nay, how bad niece it they? How ash it that? Ton I hena. No hash nana. Ni bat be thihina. Yeah. Hanto be thwa. Han it hit the ah woo. Ni bat one be thihina. Ni e say ta woo nothing. Hat ne ha walk a beth. Hash nan on it. Hat na wu na nethin ni a jehi. Hat na khabethin. How about that? Two lessons in one program. <laughs> Respect others and don't waste anything. Uh, lessons that could have been used way back then and so still very important to think about today. Uh, the world will be a much better place if we do that. <laughs> you know, speaking of buffalo, um, what you may not realize is that not that long ago, buffalo were that close to being extinct. I mean, gone, totally. But t today, not only the CNA tribes, but other tribes all across the country have herds of buffalo. And just like um, Indian people themselves, you know, the buffalo, they were almost gone, but they're, they're here. They're not going anywhere. And I think that's why we can say the same thing as Indian people. We're not gone. We're still here. We're not going away. So if you've enjoyed the show, please share it with other educators, students, teachers, principals, whatever. Uh, we love bringing these to you. So, uh, 
I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time on another episode of Cis Sisters and Anana A Today. Thank you.